God's presence when we get to celebrate one another. And um, I'm loving it, especially today when we get to celebrate my wife, you know, because sometimes I can just be that machine that just keeps going. And so it's a joy to have other people come around and just really give her a good God bless you. Isn't that awesome? Brother Mickey, good to see you here, you and your wife. It's awesome. Good to see you. Oh, yeah. Courtney, great having you here. Oh, yes. And Happy New Year to the Whiteheads. Praise God, everybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because we, we haven't seen you to say Happy New Year just yet. All righty, God is good. And I appreciate you guys. Yeah, this is probably the longest you've been on stage in recent times. Yeah, but I appreciate that. God bless you. God bless you real good. All righty. Um... So let's do this very quickly. We're just going to read together Hebrews chapter 11. And I want to say a big thank you once again to everybody. Even those who didn't come out to speak or say something. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate you all. And thank, thank you, thank you for appreciating the gift of God to the body of Christ, to myself, to this family. God is good. Royce, happy birthday. Yeah, I call my wife all kinds of names. It depends on what what dimension of the spirit I'm coming out of. So if you haven't heard that before, that's a new one, Royce. There's another version of Rosemary. Okie dokie. So we're going to do this in Hebrews 11. <laughs> it is interesting. As soon as I said, we are going to do this, I remember something that the Lord has been um, dealing with me on lately, which is this emphasis on doing the word. You know, because at first I said we're going to read this and then I said we're going to do this. And so I want us to prepare our hearts to do that which we are about to read. So Hebrews 11, chapter 7, verse 8. And I want to encourage you very quickly to recognize that when the Lord commands us to do a thing, he does so because he has already equipped us to do it. God is not unrighteous. Neither is he unfaithful. But quite often because when God is asking us to do a thing, Kanida is because he wants you to do it alongside with him. And you know how difficult it can be when you are in an office or in a business environment or in a field somewhere and you have to work with people you don't get along with. It can be hell. It can be a nightmare. And God knows how terrible it is to work with people that you do not get along with. So when God is calling you to come alongside with him to be a blessing to another or to come alongside with him in seeing to your own maturity and development, he wants you and himself to get along. And there is only one requirement that we know of, a primary requirement for getting along with God. And what is that? Faith. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to get along, alongside with him. And that is the reason why when God comes to invite somebody to come along, to place a call upon their lives, he would test to see if they have faith. And one of the ways by which the, the Lord tests if we have faith is by telling us something about us that we do not know or that we do not even believe is possible. You see, when God comes to invite you to come alongside with him, even though he comes to you, he wants you to come to him and operate at his level. So when God comes to us to find us wherever we're at, it's only a way of drawing us close. He doesn't want to operate with you at your level. So when God calls you to go and minister to somebody, he doesn't want you to minister at your level of being judgmental, your level of unforgiveness, your level of carnality, your level of all kinds of human weakness. No, he wants you to come up higher. Because a lot of what God is inviting you to do is impossible without him. The Bible says with men it might be impossible, but with God all things are 
possible. So that is the reason why when he comes, he begins to tell you things that would allow for yourself to rise from the level of being with yourself. Let me explain what it means to be with one's self. When God called Moses, and God just came in and he just started like spilling out his agenda. Oh, I have found you. I have chosen you. You will go and declare the salvation of my people. You will go to Pharaoh. You will see this. Moses was like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. And at the end of the day, when God was done, or when he thought God was done, what did Moses say? Moses says, without, in, without due respect, I need to first of all make sure that you are God. And the reason why was because what Moses wanted to say, he wanted to be very sure that this is God before he said what he wanted to say. Because if you are truly God, then you should know all things. And if you know all things, you should know that I cannot even do what you're saying. So if you were not God, I will excuse your ambition. I would say, well, this person does not know. Because anybody who knows me will not come to me and ask me to do all of that. First of all, the same Pharaoh you are asking me to go and talk to, he's looking for me. I'm a fugitive where you're asking me to go to. They want to kill me. That was all of what he was thinking in his mind. And he said to God, he says, put all of that aside. I can't even speak. And God was like, are you done? He says, well, for now. God says, look, I know. That is the reason why I have prepared Aaron, your brother, who is going to come alongside with you and do all the talking. That is the reason why I went to Egypt first before coming here and I killed all the people looking for you. Because it was said that God did not go to Moses until all the people who sought the man's life were out of the picture. And so God will come to you to reveal things to you about what it means to be by his side so that you can stop being by your own side. To be by your own side is to remain with all your limitations. To be by your own side is to conclude that the perimeters of your abilities are limited to that which is within you. And God will do that intentionally because he wants you to rise up from being where you're at to come and be with him and recognize that if I am not here on this God's side, there's no way I can do all of what he is saying. God does not want people who think they can do his will by their own ability. For you to answer the call of God on your life, for you to be able to do what the word of God says, you need God's own enablement. He wants people that will depend on him because your dependence on God is the socket that connects you to his heart. Because most things that God is asking us to do will require for us to move speedily. Will require for us to climb mountains. Will require for us to visit the valley. Will require for us to do things that will shake our faith and shake our position. So if you are not well connected to the heart of God, there is no way you can ride along with him. Because you know, God goes to make a way where there is no way. A lot of all of our fancy cars that we drive, we are able to drive those cars because some more rugged equipment came before to make a way. Nobody wants to drive a tractor or drive, drive a bulldozer or whatever the, what they call those things. You don't want to drive a skid steer to go have dinner with your wife. So we're going on a date and I'm just going to be in this paid loader. Nobody wants to do that. But you want to go in the fancy car, but the fancy car cannot ride until one of those things or a number of those things have come ahead to make a way. And so when God is asking you to do something, he's asking you to do what he does, which is to make a way where there is no way and you would have to be resilient, you would have to be rugged, it would have to be bumpy, but God wants you to do that so that others can come behind you and give glory to God. So God is always asking for us, to have faith he wants to make sure that you can see beyond what things you have seen look at all the people that Jesus called he tested them one of the biggest lessons that I have learned in ministry is to not agree to work with anybody until they are tested 
I have heard people say to me, oh, we are with you. We love what God is saying. Oh, we believe in the vision of this house. And they would say, in fact, sometimes they would describe the vision even better than me. And I'd be like, okay, you must be God sent. Yes. But when people are God sent, they're also God tested. But I shield that people from the test. Eventually, I paid for it. Because in reality, the way God works, he tells us the way that he works. He says, test all spirits that you may know that which is of me. You see, if people do not have faith and you are trying to work with them and work with a God who requires faith, you are introducing chaos into God's own scheme and God is not the author of confusion. And that is the reason why it would allow for you to learn how to separate the tears from the wheat before you take on the position of a co-laborer with God. I say all of that to say that when we come to such times as we are in, we need to remind ourselves the reason why the earth is being shaken as it is today. We need to know the reason why all of what's going on in the world is going on. The four angels of destruction. Why are they coming upon the earth? Why is the famine coming? In fact, why do people act so foolishly today? Why is there such an increase in immorality? Why are we seeing all of these things? We are because God said to us in his word that the government will be upon his shoulders. So we know Jesus is coming to establish his reign upon the earth. And there are thrones that have been prepared for you and I to reign alongside with him and before we get those thrones and those crowns we need to be tested to be sure that we can last a thousand years many of us can't even believe God consistently for three months you go to a conference and you hear the word of God let's, say, let's not even talk about conference you come on Tuesday and you hear the word of God and it's powerful and you're like oh praise the Lord I am no longer going to slumber in the night I am going to pray I am going to do this I'm going to do that and even the little things that seem to be working for you just turn upside down by Wednesday and you're like uh, maybe I was too optimistic about this God I need to dial down my expectations a little bit and then you tell God to wait while you fix your problems and God is like, uh, those problems are some of the practice exercises that I have organized so that I can see how well you can work with me. And now you want to kick me out of the room while you figure it out on your own. And God is like, no, you need my methods. Your methods aren't going to fix the problems that I created you for. And so you believe God only for 12 hours. And then you drop the ball on God. And God is like, well, the assignment that I have for you is a thousand year assignment. Revelation chapter 20. The Bible says that for a thousand years we will rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ upon the earth. We will take preeminence over the sons of disobedience and help to restore the garden that we lost. So why are we not seeing that it is actually our benefit and to our advantage that all of these things are happening? The Bible says, look at my beloved ones. He said, I have sent them to the land of the Chaldeans for their own sake. Now, how many people remember to thank God for Babylon? How many people remember to thank God for Babylon? We don't thank God for the system of this world. We're always whining. We're always complaining because the system of this world tries to make our lives difficult. And God is like, you're welcome. And you're like, no, you can't be serious. And God is like, I am serious. All of these things are for your sakes because if there are no ways to test you, I cannot approve you. And that is the reason why the word approve exists because it is our proof. It needs to prove you. So come with me to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7. Look at what it says. It says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Now there's so much to unpack here but let's read 8 first. 
And the Bible says concerning Abraham that by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Where did Abraham go? To a place that he will receive as what? As an inheritance. When he got to the place that he was going to receive as an inheritance, what happened? Did they go out to the airport to receive him with a band, singing and dancing, saying, Oh, behold, he has come, the man that owns this land. Nobody that already exists in a place wants to just give it up because you showed up. Think about it. Everywhere that God sends his people to to take possession is already occupied by somebody else. And when you see the treatment that they receive is not always the most favorable system. I mean, treatment. Where is our inheritance? Our inheritance is the earth. You know, as often as I have the opportunity, I will remind you that it is not the portion, it is not the destiny, neither is it the will of God for believers to go to heaven forever clapping and competing with the angels. It was what we were told growing up. Just live your life on the earth and endure all the pain so that one day you just die and then you go to heaven and then you will sorrow no more. But where is it in the Bible? Where is it in the Bible? What we have in the Bible is that the Lord God himself will inherit the earth and it will give the earth to us because we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus by faith. So when you think about it for a moment, do you not begin to realize that, wait a minute, is this the reason why the world system is so unfair to us? Is this the reason why the world hates the church so much? I mean, the only time the world is going to like you is when you are being like them. Because then you cease to be a threat to the darkness. But the moment you begin to shine the light, the moment you are bold enough to not go with the consensus, you know how people are when you find yourself in a place and everybody is supporting the Falcons and you decide to be the only one that says they are no good. Everybody turns against you like a pack of wolves and they want to eat you up even though you are the one saying the truth. That is only an example. I don't even follow sports, so I don't even know whether they're good or bad. Disclaimer. You understand what I mean? Because people always want you to agree with them. Why? Because when people are together, they want to maintain their association. When people are together blind, they want to stay blind together. And if you bring the light and it hurts their eyes, you're the bad person. And that is the reason why when it comes to the order of righteousness, there are three orders of righteousness, maybe four. But three of them are the human order and the fourth is the order of Christ himself. And every single one of the people that God used to teach us about righteousness are people that nobody liked. If one of them, his name is Job and Job means to be hated. Daniel was so hated that some people made it their full-time job. Every time they get to work from nine to five, they're plotting how they will get rid of him. And so you have only two people that don't like you and you think you have come to the end of the world only two people come on you can do better than that the bible says go and make disciples of men but in the process please make enemies that's what jesus said he says if you're anything like me they will hate you just as they have hated me because if we're not prepared to be hated like job and to be persecuted like daniel how in the world are we going to go where God sends us? A lot of where God wants to send you to, God knows you are not ready because he knows that you will keep the word that he has put in your mouth behind your back because the moment you bring out that word, they're kicking you out. Jesus told his disciples, he says, I'm sending you to places wherein I know they will kick you out. He said, but it's not on you, it's on them. It's only on you if you do not go. My assignment to you today, folks, is to remind you of the need to prepare to remain unpopular. Because Jesus is only working with people that are unpopular. Isaiah 45, the Bible says that the Lord will build with the stones that have been thrown out of the city. 
we are told once again by the Lord Jesus Christ himself he said upon this rock I will build my church the rock of personal revelation not the consensus of opinions I tell you what folks we are coming to a time that Jesus already told us pretty much all we need to know when they asked him about the generation of the end he says to the people that were standing in front of him the ones who asked him the question he said for you people alive now there's one sign that will be given to you and that is the sign of Jonah he said as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights so shall the son of man be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights he said but for the generation that will be here in the day of my glory he says their sign will be the sign of Noah as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the days of the son of man and look at what we see here in Hebrews chapter 7 I like the order of Hebrews chapter 7 you see, because many of us, when we're talking about faith, we're always talking about the faith of Abraham who believed God and received the seed and blah, 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 blah. And it's all nice and fun. But many people do not want the Noah kind of faith. But the Noah kind of faith is the faith that we need to have because we are living once again in the days of Noah, wherein we have giants upon the earth, mighty men of renown, wherein we see all of what was being said concerning the time of Jonah, of Noah, that people will be building houses and they will be getting married and given in marriages. And the Bible was not just talking about being betrothed, a man to a woman, but it was talking about what happened in the days of Noah when men were getting married to men and women were getting married to women and aliens were getting married to humans and humans were giving birth to giants. The same things that are happening in our world today. And you're like, how could all of that even have happened? They didn't have the technology. Who told you? They left us enough evidence for us to know that they had the technology to build those things by fallen angels. But two things that I want to bring out of Hebrews chapter 7, which we are going to pray about today as we break bread, is this. The Bible says, Noah, by faith, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. Your faith is going to be activated by godly fear let me say that again we have come we have come to another exodus when the children of Israel were leaving Goshen when they were leaving the land of Egypt to go into the promised land many of them were not ready to leave Egypt behind until God scared them do you know since when Moses had been telling them that God had come to deliver them and that was the reason why he was there all the plagues were happening and these people did not pack their bags many miracles had happened but they did not move an inch until the angel of the Lord aka the angel of death came the Bible says that was the night that they packed and put on their sandals godly fear was what activated their faith why is that important it is important to know that when God releases his angel of death it is not so that you can just be so terrified it's because he wants you to see everything that you have confidence in for what they truly are and repent and hold on to him as your source Remember what I said earlier on that God sent his children to the land of the Chaldeans for their sake. Why? Because the Chaldeans were very advanced and very organized. They had a system which is very much like the system that we're running today where in just about anything you can think about they've already figured out a way to control your actions and to tax you for it. And you know what that does to people? What it does to people is you relinquish control to the ones who seem to have gotten there before you. You don't even want to argue with them. You desire to build your house in a certain way and they tell you you can't do that, it doesn't meet code. You can't do that, it doesn't meet code. After a while you're just like, just build a house. 
however it is that meets gold and I will move into it. Why is that so? Because Satan knows that by regimentation he can bring men into submission. What does Satan know? Satan knows that by regimentation he can bring men into submission. And that is exactly, let me explain something to you about the system that we're in. The Bible says that in the last days, the system that will be upon the earth is going to be called Egypt, it's going to be called Sodom, and it's also going to be called Mystery Babylon. It is Babylon because of its composition and, and, and approach, which is confusion by mixing. Everything is so confusing. There's nobody here who can tell me they know all the tax codes. Nobody here knows all of what happens. When you think you know it, they just whip something else out and they're like, it was the fine print. We are in a system that is not straightforward. When Jesus came, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. This is it. This is all you need to know. But in the system of this world, everything is convoluted just so that you can be confused. It is called Sodom. It is called what? It is called Egypt because of how regimented it is. But it is also called Sodom. And remember Sodom and Gomorrah. What do they represent? When you put those two together, what do they mean? They mean to have a people brought together to one place and have them submerged by lots of requirements. I wish I had time to explain. But the way Gomorrah and Sodom and Gomorrah were, see, were, were, were structured was such that people were restricted and they were overloaded with requirements. Do you know how many of us today spend more time checking all the boxes of the world? Okay, I have to pay this bill. I have to go to that meeting. I have to review this document. I have to do that. We spend more time doing those things than we spend with God. If sometimes that we even spend with ourselves to enjoy this existence that is a manifestation of God's glory. Many of us don't even have enough time to enjoy this being. When the Bible says love your neighbor as yourself, you are struggling to love your neighbor because you haven't even made time to love yourself. When was the last time you took yourself out and fellowshiped with yourself? When was the last time you stopped to even just give God glory for your uniqueness, for the way that he speaks to you? for how he has been so gracious. Look at all the mistakes you've made and he allows you somehow by his mercy to still be where you are today. How many of us take the time to say, Father, well, thank you for this existence that is called me. Because we're pulled here and we're pulled there. And now we are said to be in the time wherein we need to have faith and this faith is going to come by godly fear. So how does that happen? The way that happens is this. God allows for every one of the regimentation and all of the order that we have come to submit to to be shaken in such a way that even if you want to trust in them, they will not be available to be trusted. But the moment of removal is a great moment of fear. The moment the world begins to withdraw its support the initial reaction of many people is that they will become afraid. Now let me speak to you plainly. A lot of what we know that we have relied upon in banking and legislations in general. I'm not just talking about legislations, about people's morality, whether men can use women's bathroom. No, no I'm not. I'm talking about legislation in general. And in particular, things that have to do with bread with the economy. They are being done away with. In the enemy's mind, their thought is they're about to replace it with one that is even more stringent. But in the mind of God, it is a time for it to be done away with for the kingdom of the Lord Jesus to come. But this is what will happen. When you touch that which people have always depended on, their initial reaction is not to give praise to God, but their initial reaction is to curse God and die. So when these things begin to happen, because this is 2023, we have come to the year of the most significant changes that we have seen in the system of this world. And when that happens, people will become afraid and God is saying, you will be a person of faith if you're not afraid of the world, but you are afraid of me. 
What does it mean to have godly fear? To be conscious that God is the one at work. In, in Psalms 82, God describes the system of this world and he described the office of the principalities that have been running the world since the fall of Adam. And he said to them, yes, I know that you are my sons, even you principalities. Because the Bible says that God is the father of all spirits. There is nothing made that was made without him. Even principalities and powers, they all came from God. And God says, you are my sons. He said, but you had an opportunity to look after the weak and the fatherless. He said, but you have taken advantage of them and multiplied their sorrows. You paraded yourselves as gods. He says, but now you will die as men. He said, because I am coming to take my world back from all of you and then I will give it to my children. So the Lord is coming to do all of that, but it will seem to you that it is the enemy that is at work. And God is going around and he doesn't want to smell fear. You see, because fear is the opposite of faith. If you want him to pick you up and join you to himself, when he comes, will he find faith in your heart? I want to encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for you to learn how to not walk by sight. You see, many people at the beginning of the year, they want to tell you that you're about to have your best year. Or oh, 2023, oh, it's going to be awesome. Everything that you have asked of God is going to give to you. But you and I know that God should not give us everything that we have asked because we will just kill ourselves. But guess what? I will not be doing you a service by telling you that it is going to be all nice and rosy in 2023. Because the world out there is going to burn. But the good news is that your heart does not have to burn with it. And the only way your heart is not going to burn with it is if you immediately divorce yourself from loving the world. The Bible says love not the world and love not the things that are in the world. You need to recognize that your providence is not the banking system. That your needs are met according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. How all of that is going to work, you don't need to know. But what you need to know is that God is up to something and that is exactly what you're preparing for. The faith of Noah is a faith that is able to trust God for the unseen. A grace that is able to make faith available in you to believe God for the unknown. When you go past godly fear, what is the next thing that we have? The Bible says that he started to build an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemns the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. He started to build. And do you know that up until that time it had never rained on the earth? Nobody could describe to you what the rain looked like. Because no one had ever seen rain. Do you know that up until that time, every vegetation that is on earth is watered by mist that will come out of the ground? They hadn't even seen dew, talk less of rain. And so if somebody tells you that the heavens will open and water will come and will flood the earth to the point where in this massive cruise ship that I'm building will float, you'd be like, dude, you have be smoking something. Yeah, totally. You see, because the world is designed, the world system is designed for people to operate by what they see. And nothing could be more unreliable than what you see. I mean, come on, think about it. Look at all of the fake news that we have been seeing lately. Look at all of the falsehood that is being put in front of us on the daily basis. And when you look at the word of God and you look at what is on television, you're like, wait a minute, I need to choose here. Is this true or is that true? Oh, it's all part of the plan of the enemy. Remember that the kingdom of Nimrod, the end, the end of the king, kingdom of Nimrod was what? Was Shinar. And Shinar means choose between two. That's what Shinar means. And we have come to such a time. Do you remember that there was a time when you didn't really have to choose? The public school that your child went to was a Christian school where the word of God was being taught, where hands were being laid on children. 
Do you know that there was a time that there was no difference between the Sunday school that your children went to on Sunday, children's church, and the school that they went to on Monday because they had praise and worship, they prayed in their classrooms, they studied the word of God, and they were told the truth. I'm talking about 300 years ago, two, 300 years ago, okay? Because about 100 years ago, all of that started to melt down and they started to teach lies through textbooks and everything that is against the word of God. But there was a time wherein people did not have to choose because what was before them was godly. Even though some of that was also by the hand of Satan himself. Because Satan disguised himself as an angel of light to earn our trust. And the moment we started to follow him blindly, it took a detour toward the lowlands of Shinar. Shinar has two outcomes, the lowlands or the mountains. So I put it to you folks, are you going to have the faith of Noah? To not concern yourself with the details of how you will navigate the times. Someone says, oh, but brother Moses, we know that treacherous times are coming. At least give us some practical way to prepare. Give us something to do. The most practical thing that you can do is what I told you on Tuesday last week. Discover your plan and who you are in the word of God. Everything that Noah did, he did because that was what the Lord revealed to him. So what is the Lord revealing to you? I don't have to tell you what God is revealing to me because I know how lazy people have become in this generation. If I tell you what my plan is, they're like, I'll take that one. I, I mean, that sounds good to me. What about you? And it's like, yeah, I want that too. But God is like, no, I'm building my church upon the rock of personal revelation. What am I telling you? One last thing, Psalm 108. And then we're going to pray about the faith of Noah and break bread. Before we read Psalm 108, let me just quickly tell you the reason why we read verse 8. Verse 8 was talking about the faith of Abraham. And you're wondering, okay, why did we read Abraham? I'm going to tell you just now. Look at what the Bible says about the faith of Abraham. Which we're only borrowing so that we can fully understand the faith that is needed for now. The Bible says that by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. He went out, not what? Not knowing when he was going. So how do you go out not knowing where you are going? Have you ever thought about it? You get out of your house, you get in your car, most of us now, it is right from the garage that we put in the GPS, the address of where we're going because we can't even be asked to think. I want the GPS to tell me whether I'm going left when I come out of the neighborhood or I'm going right. You put it there. When was the last time, thank you, someone came to visit you and they left your driveway in two minutes. No, they sit there. You know, the Nigerian culture, the way we were raised is you stay at your door until your guest leaves. So when I first came to America, I would be standing there waiting to wave them goodbye and people aren't going anywhere because they want to plot where they're going and they want to put the address of the detour along the way. We're going to eat in Buckhead, but we want to stop at Marketplace Boulevard and they'll be plotting and I will stand there and after a while people will wonder and say, hey, are you okay? I'll be like, yeah, I'm okay. I'm waiting for you to go. You understand what I mean? Because we are so accustomed to not setting out until we know where we are going. That is now a thing of the past. When it comes to walking with God, you cannot know where you are going. When Jesus stood Peter up the first time, he stood up Peter as an example to others. He says, this is Peter, the rock. He's just had a personal revelation by the Holy Spirit. Upon that rock of revelation, I will build my church. And then when Jesus was going to heaven, he brought the same Peter up again. And he says, you see this Peter, a time is coming wherein he will not know where he is going. Another would have to lead him. Remember that God said that, Jesus said that about Peter. He spoke about the beginning of the church and the end of the church. So at the beginning, we knew where we were going. But we have come to a time wherein another has to lead us and that other is the Holy Spirit. And so the faith that you have now is not the kind of faith that just says, oh, I believe that this plan that I have, God is going to make it materialize. God is saying, no, I want you to have a plan, a, a, a faith that just knows one thing, to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. 
So we don't know where we're going, but we would learn by the Holy Spirit to take a step. What did God say to us in September, on the 24th of September? I was here and the word of the Lord came to us concerning 2023. Because you know our communion house will begin our own year in, 20, in September. According to the Jewish calendar, because there was a reason why God gave them that calendar and told the rest of us, whatever they're doing, you may not like it, but follow this calendar. The Bible says, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. So I'm not worried about all of the genealogy and ethnicity and whatever is going on. But I know that there is a blueprint that these guys have been sitting on. So I followed that calendar. And the Lord has been faithful since we had that revelation in giving us the full scope of the year. But this year, what did he tell us? Jeremiah 17, 19. He says, you will have a word from God to go to the gate. When you get there, stand and wait for the next word. God says, it is our year to go forth but we would only take steps at the voice of God. So we're going forth. Yes, I am going forth. I am going to trust God, but I'm going to wait for a word at every turn. Now look at Psalms 108. Psalms 108. And we're going to read from verse 18. Verse 8, sorry. So Psalms 108, verse 8. It says, Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the helmet of my head. Judah is my law giver. The Lord says, Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is also the helmet for my head. Judah is my lawgiver. I'm going to talk about those two names, two out of those names. Ephraim means to be fruitful. And the Lord says fruitfulness is the helmet of my head. What is helmet? What does it represent? Putting on the whole armor of God, we put on the helmet of salvation. The moment you put on the helmet of salvation, it protects your thoughts. You're no longer thinking as one who is unsaved. Now let me explain that. A lot of the people that we, a lot of people have been teaching about the grace of God, grace of God. So none of us is kind of alien to what it means to live by grace, by faith, and not uh, to enjoy the benefit of grace by faith and not of works. However, many people fail to live out the full working of the grace of God when it comes to repentance. Repentance has to do with changing the way you think. Right, And so when God says to put on the helmet of salvation, what it means is that now your thoughts are shielded from whatever the enemy is trying to suggest. Okay? So if you have the helmet of salvation, what is salvation? Salvation is the fullness of what Christ Jesus has done to restore, to restore the blessings of God to every single believer. All of the things that were taken from us when we sinned in Adam and fell short of the glory were restored to us in that salvation. And so my, that salvation is pro protected by my mindset. And so if I am saved by grace through faith, what does the Bible say? The Bible says all things are mine. But Satan will come and say, huh, if you don't do this, there's no way you're going to get that. Nobody's paying as much as you are paying in taxes. You need to find a way to help yourself. So Satan will come and tell you that you need to be unscrupulous. Satan will come and teach you self or suggest to you self-preservation. Satan will come and say things like, those people, if you allow them to get away with that, they will continue to take advantage of you. So you know what you need to do? You just need to tell them no. Even if I can afford to tell them yes, Satan is like, just shoot your strong side. Because he's teaching you to protect yourself, but salvation is already my helmet. It protects me so that I can love freely and also believe all things. Now here is what God is saying here. God says, Ephraim is my helmet. Your fruitfulness is by virtue of the fact that you have already been saved by grace through faith. The moment you know that, no shaking in the world would allow for you to fear where your bread will come from. No torment of hell would allow for you to fear. Now I say all of these things today because the Lord said to me, fear is coming strong and your heart needs to be tight against fear. 
if we don't start to prepare now, we don't want to wait until other people are melting away around us before we now start to build our defenses. We do it now even before any film of fear can get into our hearts. So let's go. What's the other name? The other name here says Judah is my law giver. <laughs> what does Judah mean? Judah means praise. And God is saying praise is my law giver. Now, the function of the lawgiver is multifaceted. Who do we know in the Bible that is called the lawgiver? Moses. Moses was called the lawgiver. But it was the lawgiver because it was the one that the Lord used to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt and set them on their way toward the promised land. So they needed a new way of seeing themselves and a new way of thinking. <laughs> And now the Bible is saying that Judah is the lawgiver. Praising God in the time of difficulty is what brings you out and helps you to think right about God's salvation. You see, the place that we're coming into was where Daniel was warning us of. Daniel saw the deception. He said the deception is coming. And many people who love to hear the things that make them feel good. He says those who are given to, flat, to flattery will be given to deception. They are the ones that will be deceived. Because they've been going around only looking to hear what makes them feel good. He said but they that know their God. Those people who are confident in God's salvation. He says they that know their God. They will be strong and they will do exploits. They will bear fruits. They will be Ephraim. But before he said all of that, what was the attitude of those people that will be strong in God? He says, when others around them are saying there is a casting down, they will say there is a lifting up. Now, to the practical things. I want to encourage you. You know, toward the end of last year, I kept saying to you, my wife also received the same word, that we have come to the Garden of Gethsemane once again. And it is crucial for us to not be overtaken by sleep. And that you need to learn how to pray at least for an hour. Remember? We need to learn how to pray for an hour. Many people in the body of Christ who have been saved supposedly since the spring of 87 still cannot pray for one hour. Sometimes when we're doing worship, you find me here on my knees. I can be there for two hours because my body is already trained to do whatever it takes to remain in God's presence. Things like that don't happen overnight. Yes, we are being called to pray for an hour, but I know you may have to start with 15 minutes, but you need to set your eye on the prize, on the mark of the prize of the upward calling. God is calling you to come upwards. You need to pray for an hour. I'm not looking at anybody right now. I'm talking to everybody. Everybody in this room, you need to learn how to pray for one hour. You're saying, no, but brother Moses, I have yet to receive the gift of tongues, so I don't think I can be there. I don't know what to say for an hour. Open the Bible and be reading it and be walking around and be confessing what is there. But just let heaven know that you are not, that you're not living until an hour is done. Now, I know many people want to hear what to invest in. I know some people want to hear the future of the stock market. They want to know if crypto is going to bounce back. They want to know who's going to win the next election. I wish those are the things that we need to know because those ones are easy. I can tell you those ones at the snap of a finger because everything is already open. But that is not what we need. What we need is to prepare ourselves spiritually. Because we cannot walk by sight anymore. We need to move by faith. And we need to be able to take steps by the leading of the Holy Spirit. How do you hear God when God does not hear you? Many people want to hear God like Brother Moses. You want to hear God. You just want to know. This is what the Lord is saying. Uh, myself and Brother Mickey were talking before the service started. And he was like, he said, do you know that some people are afraid to come to church because they don't know what God will reveal to the men of God about them. But in reality, 
What did you say again? He then said to me, he said, but shouldn't that be the reason why people need to come so that they can know what God is saying to make amends and set their sail at the word of God so that they can overcome? We need to know what God is saying and be ready. But the Bible says, receive the word of God, the implanted word of God with meekness because it is able to save your soul. The word of God is very critical. How do you hear God? God needs to hear you first. Let me tell you something. I was having a chat with the Holy Spirit this afternoon. And one of the things that he said to me, he said, look, he says, the way you keep coming here every time, he said, it's difficult for you not to know what's going on here. And I laughed when he said that because I was just in the bathroom and I decided, I said, I want to press in. I just want the presence of God in this place. I just, I just desired it because I know the Bible is, God says, the Bible says God is committed to granting the desires of the righteous. And so sometimes I will just desire the presence of God. And guess what? The Bible says he knows who follows to know. If you seek, you will find. If he ask, you will receive. If you put yourself there and say for one hour, I'm not picking up my phone. I'm not sending text messages. I'm not talking to anybody. I just want the glory of your presence. Let me tell you something. You will get it. If it doesn't happen the first day, don't be discouraged. If it doesn't happen the first month, don't be discouraged. Remember what I said earlier, some of us just need to demonstrate that we can at least have faith consistently for three months. I just said for three months, I will pray an hour every day. Even if I don't know what to say, even if I fall asleep, ask my wife. There was a time that I got myself so buried in the business world that I was no longer praying as I should. 2012 into 2013, I was so occupied by everything else. Immigration was almost becoming my life. Work permit, all this and that. And after a while, the Lord said to me, okay, all that foolishness stops now. I want you in here. The first week, what was I doing? I will sleep and snore so loud, my wife will hear me from the kitchen. I will snore my head off because my body was no longer used to praying for that long. I'm not talking about 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I'm talking about six hours because when God said, come and pray, I knew what he was asking for. He was asking me to pick up where we left off. And so after like two hours sometimes, I'm there snoring my head off. And many of us will feel justified that, come on, two hours is a long time. No, but I knew what God was asking me to do. He wasn't asking me for his sake. He was asking me for my sake because I need to demonstrate my willingness to receive by my commitment to give. I had to retrain my body. To be able to listen you know sometimes just sit down there for 30 straight minutes you're not reading the word you're not writing anything down you're just listening your thoughts want to wonder you bring it back the bible says we need to bring everything to to, to what bring everything under subjection even those imaginations that's what the bible says you need to bring everything to submission and so you'll be there and your mind is like oh this and that come back don't feel guilty that your mind is wandering. That's what it's meant to do. But you should take responsibility for it. What was the word of the Lord? One of the things God told us about 2023. He said in 2023, I want you to learn how to take responsibility for your actions without being guilty for what you have done. So I don't feel guilty that my mind is wandering, but I take responsibility for that mind and I bring that mind back to the presence of God. I remind myself of all the things that I stand to gain when I'm in the presence of God. I remind myself of the fact that I was made for him and if he can't have my attention, what is my use? There's a reason why the world wants me so much. The world wants you so much because you have something precious. And all that is meant to be for your heavenly father. I tell people, in fact, I was telling my brother the other day, I said one of the things that the Holy Spirit is reminding me of of late is the fact that God has specific parts of the animal that he wanted in sacrifice. He wanted the flank because the Bible says take of the flank of the animal where there is the fatty lobes and set it upon the stone of the altar that is hot with fire and let it burn to me a sweet aroma. I said lately I've noticed that I don't feel like I have prayed until my sides are burning. You, you all know sometimes when you go to the gym to work out certain places start to burn in the gym. Two machines. Those things need to burn to the Lord. Don't just pray sitting down. I tell people, there is no, sitting down is not a recommended posture in the Bible. 
people don't sit down to pray the Bible. When you read about Moses, he will, he will stand up. Jesus will stand up. If they're not standing up, they're laying on their faces or they're walking. Every other posture is approved but sitting down. Because God knows. He made you. When you sit down, you know all kinds of things that happen when you sit down. Your thoughts begin to wander. So one more practical thing that I'm going to share. I just noticed the time. I didn't even know. But let me mention this one more thing. We've talked about studying the Word of God lately a lot. Now we're talking about prayer. There's one more practical thing that I want to share with you. And I want you to recognize. The Bible says that praise will be the lawgiver. Maybe this would help somebody. If you can't pray yet for an hour, praise for 30 minutes. Praise God for 30 minutes. If you don't know that many songs just yet, just keep singing the same one you know. You understand what I mean? And the same God who said, sing unto the Lord a new song, will inspire new songs in your heart. God is not judging you by your, your performance. No. He just wants to receive your sacrifice. The reason why I'm saying those two things is because of the fact that I know something about the way heaven works. Whenever God is calling us to do these two things, it's because the battle that is in front of us is not for us. We cannot fight. Egypt was too strong for Israel. And that was why God did not require them to pick up the sword. He just wanted godly fear. He wanted them to prepare to praise him. He kept telling Moses, tell them they're going into the wilderness to worship me, to worship me, to worship me, to worship me, to worship me. You see, at the end of the day, the moment I know that, I can then completely abandon myself in the presence of God in the place of prayer and in the place of worship. Because when I worship God, guess what happens? He opens my eyes to see the future. Look at David. David was one person who saw Jesus' life more clearly than anybody else. Isaiah saw his birth. People like Jeremiah and Ezekiel saw his reign. But Joseph, David, he saw the birth of Jesus. He saw the entire crucifixion. He saw how the side of Jesus was pierced. He saw how they offered him the gall to drink. He saw all of that. He even saw when Jesus says into your hand, I commit my spirit. He saw all of that and he wasn't done seeing. He followed Jesus to the grave. He saw Jesus do wonders in hell. He saw Jesus rise and he saw him being received up in heaven. He said, and I saw the Lord say unto my Lord, arise. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. What did David do all his life to enjoy such a privilege? He prays God all the time. You want to know what to do? Praise God. You want to have a confidence in God that would allow for you not to be afraid when everything else around you is stumbling down? Pray. Prayer gives you the stamina. Praise gives you the access. And so I want to encourage you, let everything else take a back seat in this season that we're in. I am passionate about what I'm telling you because I know the value, because I experience it. I've been a prayerless Christian and I have been a praying Christian. And may I never be a prayerless Christian again till Jesus comes. Because why are you a Christian if you don't pray? Jesus himself prayed and Jesus prayed every day. And most days Jesus prayed all through the night and he was God. If he being God prayed all the time, you need help. I need help to pray. In fact, the Lord is laying on my heart to share with you one more thing. Come with me to Psalm 107 verse 11. Because of the fact that this fire needs to be ignited in us. Psalms 107 verse 11. If you didn't, if you haven't listened to choose this message, go and listen to it again. And then Saturday last week, when the Lord said that we need to sit on the purple seat. You need to go and listen to that one. Simply because some of the things that I will be sharing with you going forward are only visible to the people sitting on the purple seat. 
it's a perspective thing. You will still hear the words, you will still receive principles that can guide, but for you to be able to see, you need that vantage point. So I wanna encourage you, listen to those two messages back to back in that order. Start with Tuesday and then listen to Saturday and then come back to this one. Psalms 107 verse 11, look at what it says. He says, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High, therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distress. How did the world get to where it is today? We got here because the fathers and maybe sometimes even us despised the commandment of God and God gave us the hard labor. But how is he going to save us? When we pray. He says, when you call upon me, I will save you from your distress. It is not your strategy in banking and in finance that will save you. It is not your strategy in selecting and choosing your political affiliations that will save you. What will save us is by calling on his name. Let us break bread. If we would just rise to our feet and remember what the Lord is asking us to do today. He's asking us to have the faith of Noah. To have faith in the unseen. To believe that God is ready to guide us by his Holy Spirit. If I were you, I would open my mouth and say, God, faith like Noah. To believe you for my inheritance. Faith like Abraham's. To believe your every word and I just want you in your own words before you break bread today make a commitment to the Lord renew your commitment to prayer renew your commitment to worship because Ephraim is your helmet and Judah is the Lord giver you need to be confident that God it's the one that guarantees your fruitfulness. So why don't you just ask him to receive your commitment and to empower you to stay faithful so that when men are sleeping, you are praying. The word of God says, do not give sleep to your eyes nor slumber to your eyelids. Open your mouth and say, Lord, I am committing to being a praying believer. I am committing to no longer being scarce in your presence. Whenever there is a holy convocation of your holy ones, Lord, I am choosing to be there. Guide me by your Holy Spirit in the path of righteousness for your name's sake, that I may not depart from your house all the days of my life, but that I may dwell there and behold your beauty, even the beauty of the Lord. I want you to make that commitment like David to inquire in his temple to always be in his presence and want nothing less than the fullness of that presence. My mouth will praise God because my praise give me access. The Bible says that I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. That I may declare boldly that this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice in it because the Lord made it. Even if it's calamity for the unsaved, I will rejoice because the Lord made it. Even if it is destruction for the world system, I will rejoice because the Lord made it. Even if people's hearts have become stone, I will rejoice because the Lord made it. And the ones that he sent me to will hear the voice of the Lord and receive repentance in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus and for his body that was broken. As we eat of that body today and drink of his blood in remembrance of him, Father, let us behold a new thing in righteousness. When Jesus broke bread with the disciples on the way to Emmaus, the Bible says their eyes were opened. When Jesus broke bread with his disciples on the seashore, their eyes were opened. They immediately recognized him. We know that there is the power of revelation associated with recognizing that we need the blood of Jesus, that we need his blood, that we need his body. We don't qualify to drink his blood, but we drink his blood and we're qualified. 
because no one is saved by their own blood except by the blood of the Lamb. So don't let the enemy rob you by saying, oh, you've not been living right, you cannot drink the blood of Jesus. No, Jesus says, unless you drink that blood, everything else you're doing is like filthy rags. He says, you have no part in me unless you drink the blood of the Son of Man and eat his flesh. So eat boldly, eat unto life. Eat unto prosperity and righteousness. Eat unto clarity. Eat unto open eyes that you may see great and marvelous things which you do not know. The Bible says that when Abraham tithed, his children tithed because they were in his loins. The Lord just revealed to me an, an uncommon grace that is available this very moment. And that is the grace for your children that are not here to enjoy the blessedness of this moment. As you partake of the Lord's body today and drink of his blood, let the hearts of your children remember the Lord. Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. I want you to believe that every stony house in your heart, in your house, will become a heart of flesh before the Lord by your obedience. Because the word of God says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Salvation comes to you and your household. So today, tap into that grace that allows for the hearts of your children, the hearts of your spouses that are not present here to beat once again for the Lord. This is an uncommon grace that comes by revelation, by divine insight and with a prophetic utterance. So embrace it, receive it and watch the Lord work wonders in your life. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood unto remembrance. Father, I'm in the mighty name of Jesus, we give you praise. Praise God. Let's be seated for two more minutes. John is going to come and bless the offering. And before then, I just want to remind you all that this coming Tuesday, by the grace of God, we're meeting here. I want you to invite somebody. I want you to come because the Lord said to me, there will be a different sound. A different sound. Now, let me just give you a little explanation. Whenever God wants to do a new thing on the earth, he releases a sound. Okay? When the Holy Spirit came, what did we hear? The Bible says there came from heaven a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. So this Tuesday, there will be a release of a different sound. God has given me an insight into that sound. The very first thing that I saw the sound doing was the sound was dissolving chains. And so if there is anything about you, about your loved ones that has been a thing of bondage wherein there are restrictions, wherein abilities are not able to deliver results, wherein you don't feel truly free even though the Son has set you free, I want to encourage you, do not miss the sound of freedom. Alrighty, so this Tuesday, that is my only announcement. I beseech you by the mercies of God. Do not miss it. Alrighty, God bless you, John. Amen. Amen. What a powerful word. Amen. Man. Second Corinthians nine seven says, "Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver." You know, I was reading the book of Job recently. Uh, I was trying to go through Job, you know, four or five chapters a day and trying to do Job, you know, finish all 42. And uh, one of the things God showed me in Job 42, verse 10, it says, in Job, it says, and the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. And it, it's interesting, it says, you know, he gave him twice as much as before. And if you go on to read Job, you see, you know, how he was burning offerings and even all this adversity was going for him, he was still giving. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but when a lot of adversity comes, if our friends are coming against us and stuff, you're like, man, that's not my friend, I'm not gonna talk to him anymore. You know, even his wife was coming against him and was like, you know, you need to curse God and die. And all this adversity was coming on, 
But we see Job really, you know, he stood his ground. And God was showing me this. He's like, you know, one of the, one of the beauties of this, you know, church is, you know, God has blessed us so much. It says in Deuteronomy 16, 17, it says, each of you must bring a gift to proportion the way your God has blessed you. You know, and we see throughout Job, you know, God blessed him and he, his gifts were abundant. If you see, like, go in Job 42, you know, he gave bulls and rams. If you actually go through and read all of Job, uh, he gives a lot of sacrifices to the Lord, if you actually go through and read. Um, and even people in chapter 42, it says his friends even brought sacrifices and said, hey, can you bless it? So the Lord will bless me. So when, when the whole point of it is, is when you give, it, it comes back to you. You know, when you give, you know, this house isn't after your money. You know, we use it for the kingdom to help people. And, you know, um, they're not after your money, honestly. And, you know, if we'll give money, it, Lord convicted me before, said, you know, if you'll give money to Starbucks, why won't you give money to me? If you'll give money to Amazon, why won't you give money to me? You know, and we all, you know, will be accountable one day. And God is going to say, you know, what did you do for my kingdom? Just think about that, you know. Did you take that person to lunch? Did you pray for that person? Did you, you know, give you know, the $10 to the church? What did you do? Uh, and I don't know about you, but 2022 flew by really fast. And time's getting sped up. I was reading an article recently. It said there's not even 24 hours in a day anymore. There's really 23 hours in a day is what it said. And I was like, what? And I was like, okay, Jesus is coming back for faster than we can imagine. Uh, even this week, they said the wolf moon was out. And it brought me to the book of Luke, you know, where it says the stars and the heavens and the moon, you know, it's talked about God being shown. And, you know, when you give, when you tie, that has been proven that it comes back to you. So I tell you, you know, if you're having relationship issues, give. If you're having issues in your marriage, give. If you're having issues, you know, with your friends or financially, give. Uh, pastor prayed one time. He said, you know, I pray you get 10 times back what you, what you give. And then somebody in church, I told you guys, give me $100. And it's like, God told me to give you this. I'm like, what? Uh, and that's happened to me sometimes where God told me, he's like, hey, give that person 20 bucks or 50 bucks or 40 bucks or 80 bucks. And God like told me a number and the person's like, how did you know that? Like, that's what I needed for my rent. That's what I needed for my phone bill. And I'm like, God has told me to give that to you. Uh, so I tell you, you know, as it says in Deuteronomy, 16 7 each of you must bring a gift to proportion to the way the lord your god has blessed you we got a lot of ways you can give communion house here uh you can text to give 678-929-2267 you can do you know uh church center at cash app zelle paypal and you can write a check uh, there's a lot of ways you can give and i encourage you not only to give but also get involved we have a lot of needs here you know, be involved in kids ministry, nursery, whatever you can. Be a greeter. Uh, whatever you can, you know, 30 minutes of your time ain't going to kill you. <laughs> so uh, it goes a long ways, honestly. And if we build each other up, you know, you're going to see that. You know, the early church met house to house. And you see, God has really blessed this house here. Let's pray over it. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for the tithes. We thank you for the offerings. We thank you for the word, Lord Jesus, that was here today, Lord Jesus. Thank you for, Lord, just blessing each and every person here, whatever they're going through, Lord, whatever they're going through, we lay it before your feet, Lord. You see the bird that falls from the sky, Lord. You know every hair on our head, Lord. You know the issues going in our life. Nothing is too big for you, Lord. You already paid the price, Lord. Your blood already covered it, Lord Jesus. Sickness, disease, relationship issues, financial issues, Lord. We just put your blood covering over it now, Lord. We thank you the need is already met, Lord. Thank you for the tithes. Thank you for the offerings, Lord. As you multiplied the bread, Lord Jesus, as you multiplied, Lord, the loaves and the fish in the Bible, Lord. We thank you for multiplying the tithes and offering, multiplying communion house now. In the name of Jesus, your mighty name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. What a night we had tonight. We give God praise. Y'all know we'll be back, what is it, Tuesday for Family Dinner and Teaching Tuesday. We want y'all to come fellowship with us. We're going to eat good. Fellas, uh, Monday, we're going to do Men's Monday, all right? Uh, we'll send the details in the WhatsApp chat. If you're not in that chat, um, let me know. We can get you plugged in there. We're going to go chop it up, eat good, play a few games of pool, and we'll go from there, all right?
Father, we give you praise. We thank you so much for this time of fellowship, what you've done here in this house, dealing in our hearts, oh God. Lord, we thank you for this week that we head into. We ask that you be glorified, empower us by your Holy Spirit, oh God, that everything we do this week be pleasing in your sight. We thank you for the man and woman of God that you set before us and the word that you have ministered to us tonight. Now, Lord, help us to run with it. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, and so be it. Everyone have a blessed night.